Well, thank you so much for being here today, Dr. Sutton. We really appreciate it. Thank you for having me. <laughs> um, just to begin with, I think it might be nice um, if you could tell us a little bit about your role on campus and involvement with SHIFT. Definitely. Uh, so my name is Ryan Sutton. I am a psychologist by training. Uh, I'm located within a I'm positioned within a division of diversity and community engagement on UT's campus. And specifically, I direct the Human Sweat Center for Black Males. And I also direct the Community Integrated Health Initiative, as well as a few other things. And in those few other things, I sit on the steering committee for the SHIFT initiative as well. I also serve as a uh, professor of practice within the educational psychology department. That's amazing. Um, there's a lot of like really great intersections there um, yeah. in terms of your work. Um, but kind of speaking of that, you know, I noticed that there is like a clinical side and a research side to um, the things that you're involved in. And would you be able to share a little bit more about those um, and how your work is really rooted in a lot of those important intersections regarding mental health and identity and how those all play a role on campus? Yeah, I'd say the majority of my work right now, I do do some research, but the majority of my work is working with students on holistic development, working on just the various aspects of who they are, what they struggle with, um, their everyday life in order to improve functioning overall, right? Improve functioning in relationships, improve functioning academically, improve functioning on, on the home front, just across the board and helping them to understand what are the ways in which they operate? What are the mechanisms they use to cope? What are the struggles they come up against? What are their perceptions of reality and how has even their past circumstances and their positionality of who they are in this society impacted the way they perceive and engage with the world and how the world perceives and engages back with them, right? Because it creates this synergistic dynamic that can perpetuate certain practices or thoughts or uh, ideas over and over again and catches us in the loop. So helping students to really understand and break down how are they operating, how are they engaging, and what may or may not need to change in order to help them get on the paths and the directions of the goals they want to accomplish. Absolutely. Um, such important kind of conversations happening. Um, and when we think about, you know, coping and behavioral change, how do you think substance use um, plays a role in all of this? Yeah, I think huge. I mean, first of all, when we talk about substance use, I, I like to think about it in the same way about when we talk about mental health, right? Because I think we're coming into an age where people are becoming more open to talk about mental health. We're not quite there yet, but we're coming more open. So we'll talk about mental health, I always say, within three conditions, right? We'll talk about it from an academic standpoint. We'll talk about it from a theoretical standpoint, or we'll talk about it from an us versus them standpoint. And what we need to do, even when we talk about mental health, is to bring our full selves into the conversations and know that we have a place at the table in this conversation and not just your uncle to them, not just your auntie and them, not just your cousin or that dude up the street, but you yourself. And I think when we talk about substance use or substance abuse, we do the same thing, right? We'll talk about it academically, we'll talk about it theoretically, or we'll talk about it from an us versus them perspective. But when we start bringing ourselves into the conversation and realize I exist within a culture that may perpetuate, that has the hands of maybe reducing this impact of substance use, then I find that I have a role in the conversation, an actual practical role within the conversation, right? And it doesn't have to be with, oh, you have a loved one that has substance abuse, or you have a friend who struggle with substance use, or you yourself, but it could also be how are we continuing to perpetuate the stereotypes or ideologies around substance users or substance abusers um, in terms of you know, the society we let, we're in? How does the greater narrative influence the way we view and see other people and engage with them? and then perpetuate a certain narrative or certain interactions, um, or how are we even treating each other in order to help someone who's on this journey succeed, do better, or, or what have you. But until we start bringing ourselves personally into the conversation with our experiences and thoughts and behaviors and ideas, then the conversation still exists on a far off nature. Absolutely. I really love that idea of bringing your authentic self into 
into this dialogue and, and being able to have it fully with um, with the people around you. Absolutely. And, and I think part of that too, right? I love the fact that you said authentic. Uh, I mean, I'll be real. I didn't say authentic. You did, but I agree with it. And I love it because the authentic self means you don't have to have all the answers. You don't have to know everything. You might say some stuff wrong sometimes. But until you're able to put yourself out there and be open to the narrative and the changes and, and, and be able to adjust and readjust, it's uncomfortable, but it's necessary. Definitely 100%. Um, I wanted to go back to some of the words that, you know, um, we have thrown around in this conversation, healthy coping, uh, maybe even like holistic well-being. Like these are a lot of phrases that come up when we're talking about, you know, mental health, about culture change. Um, but as, a, as students, you know, sometimes those words just have like an abstract meaning. So how would you kind of distill them down to something tangible? And why should students care about, you know, creating an environment that fosters healthy coping, a broader sense of well-being? Yeah, definitely. You know, one of my favorite sayings, and I don't know if I created it or I got it somewhere else, is you're going to be your own biggest snitch. You're going to be your own biggest snitch. You, you could push down your emotions. You could hold them in. You could not speak up, but they're coming out. They're coming out behaviorally. They're coming out through somatic symptoms, you know, uh, physical symptoms. They're coming out through your work. They're coming out somehow. So in essence, subconsciously, unconsciously, your, your body is always trying to, body, mind, and spirit is always trying to cope. It's always trying to, I'm sorry, my children just came into the room. Uh, very nice. That is beautiful. I like them both. Good job, y'all. Awesome. Thank you. They're five and three. So yes, they're lovely. Um, so your body's always going to try to cope with what's going on around you, right? Is your body's always going to try to respond. So whether you're intentionally trying to cope or not, you are going to do something to cope. You have your natural tendencies to which you always go back to. And in this case, we're talking about substance use or substance abuse, but it's not always that. Substance abuse is just a symptom. Some of people out there, you don't use substances, but you know you pick up that credit card and you hit up um, um, online like crazy and you got Amazon boxes at your door left and right and you know you shouldn't be doing that stuff, but the cops aren't gonna come knock on your door for that right? Or some of you might have just a very um, intense, profound procrastination method to where you don't procrastinate. And it's not creating a healthy, conducive environment to your learning and your health and you're catching yourself experiencing anxiety and all this stuff because of your procrastination tendencies. We all have adaptive and maladaptive, positive and negative coping strategies that we will unconsciously put into effect. So when we start understanding why is healthy coping important is because your body's going to try to cope one way or another. The best thing that you could do is be at the forefront of it to actually have more of an active, intentional, and purposeful say on how you are going to cope, right? You know, when you start talking about stressors in your life, there's, you know, uh, general models about that, that your body will go through an alarm state a resistant state than an exhaustion state. But even as it goes through these things, your body's gonna create or try to create homeostasis the whole time through. And what it draws to or what it goes to can be any number of things if you're not careful about what you're intentionally choosing. So it impacts us all. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much for sharing that. I think that definition was so comprehensive and kind of help clarify things, but also put things into a different perspective, um, a lot more relatable perspective, awesome. which I definitely appreciate. Yes. Um, and I'm sure a lot of students will as, as well. Um, for our last question, this is kind of thinking, thinking broadly towards the future. You know, your work is housed in, I think the DDC. Yes. Um, and so, um, which has a lot of different agencies and offices that have been doing important work to create a more inclusive, welcoming, a safer campus climate for everyone. Wow. Um, so thinking like five, 10 years down the line, like what kinds of support systems and resources do you envision having for students um, and faculty and staff on campus that just kind of work towards that goal? Like what, what, what do we hope to see? 
I would actually say if we're going to dream big, I would take a step back and say, I'm not sure if my big picture is even a system. I think my big picture would be on an organic process that really takes involve the cultural context of each student from which each student comes from with this greater lens. And really, how do we infuse all these conversations and these thought points into an organic relationship or process on campus, right? Because I think oftentimes when we set up systems and we set up programs, they're typically reactionary. We, we see that something has fell short or something hasn't measured up or something's not being addressed or there's a disparity somewhere or there's this uh, problem somewhere that we need to solve, right? And then here comes a system or a program to do it. But if we're dreaming big, and I think that's what you were asking me, dream big, I would say, can we be proactive in how we bring ourselves to the conversation, how we're able to view and bring context to the conversation in order to provide the environment or the elements that each student needs to blossom in, in their setting. You know, and I think that cultural element is highly important. Uh, one thing I'll say is um, oftentimes behavior is conceptualized based on the bodies in which they come from. I'll say that again, a lot of times our behaviors are conceptualized based on the bodies in which they come from, which basically means that two individuals can objectively do and engage in the exact same acts, but because one might be um, a Hispanic American female and one might be um, maybe a Caucasian male, those behaviors are gonna be interpreted through a different lens, which then impacts how people respond to you and quite frankly, how you'll respond to people. But when we could bring ourselves into the mix and we could bring the context into the equation, then how can we create an equitable climate or an equitable community that can really foster this development? Um, I know most people might be listening to this and being like, Doc, you're dreaming far off. And I would agree with you, maybe I am. But if we're gonna shoot for something, I say, let's have the clear goal of what we're trying to get to in mind and then slowly figure out how we get there in the process. But if I want to scale it back a little bit, when we start talking about programs and services, you know, I think integrative health, I know we have integrative health on campus, but things that are very holistic and not compartmentalized. Because none of this work, especially when you're looking at behavioral health, is a compartmentalized work. We're dealing with whole students, whole human beings, whole entire people that you can't compartmentalize in order to treat, in order to enhance, in order to develop but you have to do it in one. So systems that are very holistic and interdisciplinary and so forth. And that's one reason why I love serving on this shift steering committee. It's a very interdisciplinary team from various aspects, um, various cultures, various identities, and hopefully the amalgamation and the combination of all of this provides the, the lens to which we can move the climate of campus in that direction. Absolutely. Uh, thank you so much. It reminded me um, that vision is just so inspiring, you know, of, of really looking into and delving into people's intersecting identities and bringing that all um, into play and understanding how those all, all work together. Um, it reminded me of something I think I had seen in the CIHI Community Integrated Health Initiatives um, yes. social media page um, from Dr. Mullen about think a cathedral thinking and thinking big and, and um, I I was truly inspired by that and I'm truly inspired by your response too, so. Yeah, no, yeah, definitely. We had uh, Dr. Mullen on one of our health uh, speaks, our health conversations that we hold with CIHI and that was one of the nuggets she drops, but this whole cathedral thinking and thinking on the on a larger scale, on a broader scale and, and getting out of our little siloed boxes is one of the many jewels that she drops. Now, she's a phenomenal individual when we start thinking about this health equity work. Um, so yeah, no, definitely. I think she inspired me as well with, with her comments there. Thank you so, so much. Is there anything that you wanted to add before we kind of conclude um, this interview? I think for anybody who's listening to this conversation and, and please make sure you're continuing to listen to these shift spotlights that come up, 
really take a step back and start understanding these uh, topics or conversations in a totality. And what I mean by that is how do they actually intersect with your life specifically? I encourage all you take a step back and some of you might say, you know, I don't use substances. I'm not a substance user. I don't have them in my family. I don't even have them in my community maybe. But how, still ask yourself and push yourself, how does this topic or conversation or this issue still intersect with who you are? And I think if you take a time to think it through a little bit, you will find the intersection because we all exist within a greater community in a greater context. So just like you can't compartmentalize yourself in the very aspects of what you have going on for you, it's kind of hard to compartmentalize yourself from a greater society. So really try to place yourself into this conversation. I think when you do that, you'll find more meaning in it, more purpose for it. And I think you better be a little bit more willing to engage with it so that we're all moving in a trajectory that benefits us all.